Well, let's see. The last time you were here, uh, we chatted briefly, but we didn't talk very much about you. I think we talked mostly about how the how the uh, mantle of uh, James Bond passed on to you. I think we did. Yes, uh, I, I want to well. talk a, a little bit about that, but I also want to ask. Uh, uh, some questions about uh, you, and uh, I think that would be interesting. That, uh, finding out a little bit about uh, you shed some light on the, the way you work and the way you think. I know you were born in 1926, and your father was uh, what? He was an Anglican priest, and he worked in a small mining community in the north of England. And his story, I mean, he, he's long gone now, but his story was that the day before I was born, he was out with the miners gathering coal off the slag heaps to keep my mother's bedroom warm because uh, they were right on the end of a long mining strike, which is what's going on in England now. In fact, we've got a mining strike that's gone on for seven months. They had one in 1926, and it ended, I think, the day before I was born. About the 19th of November. And I'm moving just a little bit closer to yes, the mic. I'm squeaking a bit there. What was it like growing up uh, the son of a, a minister in a coal mining area of England? Well, I, again, I'm sorry. I, I didn't grow up the son of a minister in a coal mining area because mm. for my mother's sake, my mother was rather sick, and we had to move south, and we moved to a part of Berkshire that I love very much. And that's really what I consider my my home, which is in the south of England. And in fact, I've gone back to that area and I'm living about 30 miles from the place where, in fact, I, w I was brought up. Going back to your roots? Back to the roots, yeah. Well, no, in a way, yes, in a way, no. My roots, as far as I'm concerned, but in fact, I am half what we call in England Geordie, which is uh, sort of the northeastern part of England. Newcastle on Tyne. And I'm half Cockney because my father came from Hackney and he was a real Cockney. And so I'm half of each of those things. You don't sound half cocky. No, they all they all say that. I can do it if you like. <laughs> I bet you can. Uh, you were. Uh, I know you were a theatrical critic, or we call. I guess we call them uh, I, a theatrical journalist. Is the way the biography uh, states. Uh, I guess. Yeah, I, I, that was the word I chose because I chose that when I was doing the job because um, I was doing more than. I don't like the word critic period. I don't like the word critic anyway. I don't believe there are any except in the, the, the sort of upper echelons of literary circles, and I don't move in literary circles with a capital L. Uh, I'm strictly a, a guy who writes books to amuse people and to entertain people. Um, and they wanted to make me theatre critic of the newspaper, and I said, no, I would like just to be the, the theatre journalist, because I was interviewing people as well as writing about plays. John Gardner, you said a moment ago that you were half Cockney. I'm confused about what a Cockney is. I had understood that a Cockney uh, was someone who grew up in a area of London. Yeah, that's right. My father grew up in an area of London. They are supposed to, uh, the true Cockney is supposed to have been born with an ear earshot of Bow Bells, the Bells of Bow Church. And my father was. He was, he was the real thing. So I'm, I'm half Cockney. What the heck, you know. I'm also of Scandinavian origin somewhere because my mother's maiden, maiden name was Henderson. And that's very much a Scandinavian name. But Cockney, saying one is Cockney or half Cockney, isn't that like saying one is half Brooklynite or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So it has... Exactly. Uh -huh. And indeed, uh, Brooklynites do have a very distinctive dialect, not unlike so, Cockney. So do Cockney, yeah. yeah. The biographical data the publisher sent uh, indicated that you were not the greatest student in the world. No, I wasn't. I was lazy. I was extremely lazy. And it wasn't until... I, I mean, I got into the service at, uh, right at the end of the war. I was um, with the Royal Marine Commandos. I was with 42 Commandos. And I was a commando training unit as well for a while. And when I came out, it was only then that I started to really buckle down and do any work. And I didn't do that very well. And uh, I'm more or less self-taught. I refuse to be taught by teachers at school, except one, one particular teacher. But you were admitted to the university. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, they didn't know I didn't have the necessary certificates. They came back, I'd been an officer in the Royal Marines. And simply because I'd been an officer, they said, yeah, we'll take you. They didn't ask for any educational things at all, so I went up to Cambridge, and I took a degree. 
and I'm a Master of Arts in Cambridge. You were going to follow in your father's footsteps and become a clergyman. Well, I did, in fact, follow. Um, I, I got myself ordained, and it was the day I was ordained, well, 24 hours after I was ordained. I've said this so many times, a, a little voice in my head said, wrong. And I suddenly realized I'd got myself into a situation that I should never have got into. And it took me four years or so to get out of it. But I finally did, did get out of it and uh, started being a journalist. And from being a journalist, started to write books. Your first book was called Spin the Bottle? That's right, yeah. And that book dealt... Never published in this country. Hmm. That uh, dealt with a drinking problem that you had. Yeah, I did indeed. Some 26, 27 years ago. I didn't know it, but I was six months from death. I was on two bottles of gin a day. I knew something was wrong, you know. <laughs> but uh, luckily found the right doctor, and I went into a clinic... The doctor took me in, free of charge. For some peculiar reason, he seemed to think I was worth saving. And um, I recovered in four weeks, that happened. And I haven't had a drink since. Not one drink? No. Not even a sip of wine? No. Nothing? No, no. Don't want to take chances. <laughs> you know, would you drink strictly? That's, that's the answer, really. That's the thing that one implants in one's head. Uh, I smoke, yes, but I don't drink. No alcohol. Why did you develop this drinking problem? Oh, I think, you know, you're born with it. Uh, at least you're born with the, 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 the elements that make it up. And I think it's probably stress that brings it on. I think it was the stress of being in the wrong, wrong job that brought it on with me. And um, I began drinking very heavily indeed. This coincided with the time you were a yeah. clergyman? Yeah, yeah. And the stress brought it on and just got out of control completely. Um, How did it have an impact on your life, this heavy drinking? Did it have an impact? Did it? It had a terrible impact. Yeah, how? How did it have an impact? Well, it ruined me just about. I mean, it took all my money for one thing. Everything I made went on booze. It wasn't enough for the housekeeping. You know. That was one thing, and it was difficult to hold down a job. Um, and then, pure luck, with the right doctor uh, happened to come along and completely changed my life. And I became sober and... Uh, started really to work there. That was really the time it all changed for me, and I became the real person that I am and not the fraud person I was then. But it's a long, long while ago now, Tom. It's, it's well, thank goodness for your many uh, fans that you did change these habits. Tell me about your first work of fiction. First work of fiction was a, was a sort of spoof spy book called The Liquidator, which led, as they say, to overnight success. You know, you work for about ten years at something and you're immediately an overnight success. I remember just after it came out, it became a bestseller and there were movies and the whole thing was happening. Someone wrote in one of the newspapers, you know, now John Gardner writes every day. For heaven's sake, I've been writing every day and most of the night for a good ten years before that happened. You introduced Boise Oaks. That's right, yeah. And he went through, I think, eight books. Eight? I think I wrote eight of those, yeah. He's an unusual hero, isn't he? Can you describe he him? He was a course? sort of... In, at the time the books came out, which was, what, the early 60s, he was right for the time. He was a, he was a square peg in a round hole. He was a coward. He was shiftless and lazy and a bit of an idiot and was only interested in money, women, and the good life. And... Uh, mistakenly someone in the intelligence world thinks that he's a born assassin and um, gets him into the job and he takes it when he wouldn't hurt a fly and he has to subcontract the assassination that was the idea behind it and it made for eight I think quite amusing books I think they're rubbish now yet they've been republished in England and I still get fan mail about them it's extraordinary well, isn't it ironic that uh, you are now writing about a spy who is the antithesis of uh, of uh, Boise Oaks? Well, it's strange. This is very strange indeed, because Ian Fleming died the day before the first of those books, The Liquidator, was published. And one newspaper the next day had a headline above a review of The Liquidator saying, Is the mantle of Ian Fleming going to fall on this man? And the answer was no. <laughs> not, not for years later, and then it happened in 1979, yes. But mind you, my track record from, from Boise Oaks, I, I threw aside the Boise Oaks mantle, eventually started writing more serious novels of espionage, which 
really engage most of my time. Mr. Bond engages about four months of the year for me. The rest of the time I'm working on slightly more serious things. I, I've just completed, we're just beginning to edit um, the first of a large trilogy, which is going to be a fictional account of, oh, I suppose, the espionage of security and secret services since 1909 to the present day. And it's going to be three volumes with an overall title, The Secret Generations. And Putnam, I think, are doing the first of those round about this time next year. Oh. You never met the Ian Fleming, did you? No, I, I didn't. Um, I've met a lot of people connected with him in the past few years, naturally, but I, I, I didn't meet him then. Did a lot of negotiations have to take place before... Uh the Fleen, uh, Ian Fleming estate, Glidrose, is that right? Well, uh, uh, Glid contracted Glid with Ian you? Fleming sold out the literary copyright to this firm, Glidrose, who are part of an even bigger firm called Booker McConnell, uh, who give the famous British Booker Prize each year for literature. Uh, Ian Fleming sold out the literary copyright before his death, and so they owned the literary copyright. And I think it was 1979, they drew up a short list of six people uh, which, for reasons which escape me now, I was the first one on the list, and they approached me and said, would you like to do it? And I sort of hesitated for two seconds and said yes, because you don't turn down a thing like that. Didn't have so to. If, if I'm not going to do it, someone else is, so I might as well. I'm the first to be asked, so I'm going to do it. They didn't make you go through a tryout or a writer's test, did they? Oh, they did, yeah. Yeah, that, I sat in front of a board, and they asked me how I would do it. Happily, I answered it correctly. And um, we were all taking a risk. They were taking a great risk. I was taking a risk because it could have backfired on my own work. It hasn't. And, of course, it could have backfired completely, and the whole thing could have fallen apart after the first book. But we did put some things in the contract to make sure that either they could get out or I could get out very quickly. You entered into uh, an agreement to write three James mm. Bond books. Yeah. And then another agreement to write another three. So you and the one that's just come out now is the first of the second three. There are two to go. This could go on forever, you know. I don't think so. No? Why not? Oh, I don't think so. I think, um, I think for me it's got to end after another two. Do you have any... Unless, of course, they come up with some incredible offer, which is unlikely. What does it feel like being a writer and taking someone else's uh, creation and putting him in the plot? Very weird. It's very difficult, surprisingly enough. Very, very difficult indeed, because you do feel the constraints on you. You feel the ghost of Ian Fleming breathing over your shoulder, for one thing, and you, you feel the very, very human uh, element of Glidrow's sort of monitoring almost every word and saying, no, you can't do that because Mr. Fleming wouldn't have done that or Bond wouldn't have done that. And um, he worked within very narrow guidelines. Uh, it's often pieces that I'm told I have to take out. Uh, the piece in, in Roll of Honor, in fact, where I, right at the end someone suddenly spotted that I'd made, and I, I'd done it quite unintentionally, uh, I'd made Bond have political thoughts. And you can't do that, because Bond has readers who are of the far left or the far right and the middle, and you're going to offend somebody if he actually has political thoughts. You can let M have political thoughts, but you can't let Bond have political thoughts. And so that all had to be... The thoughts he was having had to be attributed to M. We had to change it. And you are back uh, in England, about 30 miles from your birthplace. Mm. At one point, however, you had gone to uh, Ireland to live. I lived in Southern Ireland for five years, yeah. I think I was living there when the last time we met. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, in fact, I was talking to Frederick Forsyth uh, a week or two ago. He also... Well, Freddie was in town. Fred, Freddie was here, and uh, he... Uh, there's so many people who have gone to Ireland, I presume, for the uh, tax benefits. That's right, yes. Uh, let's see, uh, Richard all, Condon. And yeah, they all come home now. What's that? Yeah, they all leave, though, after a while. Why is that? What, you left, uh, Forsyth left, Condon left? Condon left before any of us, I think. <laughs> uh, Freddie left... Um, I think Len Dayton's still there, but we all came back. Uh, I, I think it's a case of, for me, it was a case of I, I'm not a born um, sort of immigrant, really. Uh, I want home all the time, and England is home, and uh, 
I, I like that, and I, I had this longing to get back, and I, I stuck for five years. But it wasn't more than sticking it, it was all very pleasant. I mean, everyone was very nice. And it, it was pleasant, but I did long for home. And uh, my wife got rather annoyed because I kept saying, Look, I'm going over to London next week. And she said, well, I've got to stay here because of my mother to see to and this, that, and the other. And I used to say, tough, you know. I had to come back and get a taste of England. And then it didn't become very fair to her because she started to long for England as well. And uh, so we finally came back. But you got the tax man looming over you now. And England is notorious for taxes. That's right, yeah. Something that you're willing to put up with. I think I'm what do you put up with that and I live in England, yeah. Why not? Well, we have a, a brand new James Bond book, uh, Roll of Honor. Perhaps uh, for the benefit of uh, American listeners, you could give us a little brief synopsis about... Oh, what? I'm not going to give you a synopsis. Don't well, doesn't, doesn't right? James... It's, it's, uh, people have to go out and buy it. And well, it. they have. They should know, don't shouldn't I mean, they, that it, Bond leaves the service and no, becomes, he, yes, goes up he, for hire? He resigns from the service because he's accused of doing something he didn't do and he takes uh, takes umbrage of this and leaves and will not be taken back but of course therein lies another story and um, he's taken up for hire by somebody else well. but uh, there are little twists and turns along the way and naturally as in all good Bond books uh, he saves the world from complete disaster you spoil the, the ending room. for us but we, we that, no I'm not spoiling the <laughs> ending for you it's formula writing it is what Bond aficionados want and that's what they get they want each year they want to see James Bond save the world or part of the world anyway from utter disaster uh, in a different way each time I hope we're not running out of ways I don't think we will you know but, uh, just a last question you and you touched on this uh, you had indicated in Roll of Honor you gave Bond uh, some political opinions. But you have uh, shaped the character of Bond to a degree in your, in your own way, haven't you? I hope so. I hope I've made him more of a man of the 80s, just as he was a man of the 50s and 60s uh, when Mr. Fleming first created him. And I hope I haven't um, in any way offended the shade of Mr. Fleming by bringing him into the 80s and making him, a, I hope, a man of the 80s. I hope he would have approved. I hope he does approve. I hope he's smiling benignly on me. Oh, I'm sure he is. John Gardner, you said that you spend uh, four months of the year working on uh, James Bond. That is, four months writing the, the book, is that uh, correct? Four months researching and writing, yeah, uh -huh. and being told to write it again. <laughs> But uh, you're doing your other writing at the same time. You mentioned your, your oh, new sure. book that's coming out, so yeah. writing must be still, must be a 12-month uh, process for you. Yes, it is, to the extent that you know, I suddenly woke up this beginning of this March and um, realized I hadn't really taken a proper holiday for six years. and It was very cold in England, so I went out to Florida for, for a month and took my first holiday for six years. But apart from that, I'm usually I'm sitting in my study or I'm with publishing people seven days a week, including Sundays. Tapping it out, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you use a word processor? Yep. Well, I use a computer. I won't use a dedicated computer. Mm -hmm. I use a computer with a program for work. Did you have problems uh, learning to use it? No. No. I, I spend a lot of time with computers. In fact, too much time, probably. And I work on them, and I file everything on them, and I have sort of character files and things like that. And uh, I write on them and print out. Uh, but I have another computer in the same room where I go and play strategy war games and adventure games and fly airplanes. And all the stupid things that I always wanted to do with a kid and never got a chance to do. Well, you certainly have it now. And thank you very much for coming in and uh, telling us uh, a little bit about uh, your background and the process of writing. And I know that uh, your readers are not going to be disappointed by uh, James Bond and Roll of Honor. Thank you very much, Don. Thank, thank you, you very much.